This is The Saving Podcast with David and Karina Anderson, episode number 69. We would love you to support us on Patreon. Just visit www.patreon.com forward slash sailing. Hello again, it's David Anderson here and thank you for joining me for the 69th episode of The Sailing Podcast. Now today's interview, it's with Michael, Liz, Andy and Holly of Sail Surf Rome. Now Karina and I joined the crew of SV Rome for an afternoon on the Noosa River and uh, we heard about Rome, which is a home-built, spirited 480 design by Craig Shunning and it was built by the Holt family on the east coast of Tasmania. Now Michael contacted me from Bundaberg, they'd just checked back into Australia after sailing from Fiji where they'd been surfing the sort of famous cloud break surf break. Now they sailed overnight to get to Noosa and they picked us up in the dinghy and uh, took us out to check out Rome and then we recorded the interview and and during the interview we heard about the building of the boat, uh, about sailing across Bass Strait, about sailing in Tasmania and sailing to Middleton Reef and then what it was like in New Caledonia and we also heard about how they balanced between work and sailing. Now it was a bonus to have Karina back on the podcast and uh, she's very good at asking uh, some personal questions about life and how they get along on Rome and uh, so you'll be able to find links to their YouTube channel. Uh, it'll be at thesailingpodcast.com forward slash 69, uh, the Sail Surf Rome YouTube channel, uh, there's a Sail Surf Rome website. You can pretty much find them anywhere by just searching for Sail Surf Rome. And now, here's the interview. Well, hi, Michael. How are you going? Thanks for inviting Karina and I out to your lovely boat, Rome. Thank you very much. uh, Welcome to Noosa. We're excited. We've had a bit of a walk around the boat. It's awesome. And I want you to explain to everybody uh, how you got this all put together. But first of all, introduce us to your crew. We've sort of been chatting for a little while, but just so everybody can pipe in uh, with some stories about your sailing. Quickly, can you let us know who's here? So we've got my partner, Larissa. Hello. Recently engaged, Martin mm-hmm. Larissa. Oh, congratulations. She's, yeah, she's, how she's uh, that? <laughs> <laughs> Only a couple of weeks ago oh, yeah, in Fiji. Um, she's a full time crew member on Rome. Um, Holly, Cova. Holly's from the UK. She's my brother's partner. Uh-huh. And she's been with cruising on board with us for six months, our whole season. Um, my brother, Andy. Um, Andy lives, the home, Rome's his home as well, so he's full time crew on board as well. Uh, Bronk is with us. Bronk uh, joined us in Fiji the night before we left as a uh, someone looking for a passage back to Australia and this will be his, this will be his last night on board Rome so we'll be celebrating tonight both Andy's birthday and Bronx Monk leaving us he's been with us a couple of weeks and now we've had a great sail back back to Oz and cleared in and uh, we're also joined by Karina I'll introduce us David's yeah. wife who doesn't get a, hasn't had a voice on the podcast for a little while so we've uh, forced uh, forced her to, to be involved in this interview it's a very special episode isn't it Karina <laughs> and um, yeah I'm Michael sorry to yeah, yeah, and my Michael... about myself there a sec. I'm Michael. I'm the owner and builder of Rome, or co-builder with my father, and, and owner of the boat and Excellent. owner of Rome. And and I don't think I said it at the start. We're in Noosa, which was exciting. You gave me a, a Facebook message and said, "Hey, I'm cruising by. Let's uh, catch up." And Critter and I are really excited to get a chance to come out and sit on the water here. It's beautiful, and it's a beautiful boat. Tell me a little bit about the boat, and then we'll talk about the fun sailing stuff. All right. Well, Rome is. Well, the, the fundamentals of it is a Spirited 480, uh, Craig Shining Design DIY kit boat, built by my father John and I in Tasmania. Uh, it's been on the water a bit over 12, well, almost 18 months. It's had a mast for about a year and been sailing not quite that long. And in that time, we've uh, become home for everybody. Yeah, so now we're a, a four-person travel team. They say it's been on the water 18 Months. Yeah, we launched April. Hang on, you sort of skipped because I think there was a little bit of time of construction yeah, before so, that. Yeah, How long was it? Six being years in built? the shed in Tasmania. Six years of uh, hard work. Yeah, I bet. Is that uh, full time work? Well, you could almost say that because my dad was sort of he's a retired and he was working on it, not full time, but most days for up to four hours a day. And then I'd come and go because I sort of worked a bit, saved up a bit, worked on the boat, went back to work, sort of did it part time. So I was doing like big days in blocks. I, I, I work on a bigger ship, doing month on month off, working on it. So a, how, in, how many in, hours in a week? Shipping. How many hours a week would you spend 
would have spent working on. It went in big bursts, I guess, but I guess we can. I can't really answer that really that accurately, but when we're going hard on it, we'd be doing maybe sixty to eighty hours a week, and then when we're not, we'd be doing you know twenties and forties. Depends like with the surf was, and <laughs> <laughs> you can't just live in the shed. You, when you're twenties, you got to go do stuff every now and again. So when you average it out, it's almost like it was full time in on hours of, yeah. on top of your normal working yeah. week. Yeah, because when I was away, I work you know shift work, so 12, 12 13 hours a day. So that's busy time. So that adds up to a equivalent of a normal work. And then when you're at home, probably get into the boat as much as I could. I pushed a lot of other things around in life to be able to build it. It's just such a lovely boat. Like when you've taken us through here and just when you walk on into this boat, it's like walking into someone's lounge room. It's just lovely, someone's home. And you walk in and just feel feel relaxed. And, and it's just, everything's so nice and clean. The lines are so lovely. I want to move in. <laughs> I'm glad that you pointed out it's nice and clean. And because we are, yeah, it's been a messy kind of couple of weeks getting back to Oz not. and Ocean Crossing. We had a quick little clean up this morning, but that's nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine days at sea, well. a couple of days in Bundaberg, and then another overnight passage to Noosa last night. So yeah, yeah. So you literally just sailed into Bundaberg from where? Fiji. From Fiji. So you went straight through. You didn't go through. Vanuatu or nah, Newcastle we, we, we on the way back? we spent some time in Newcastle on the way out. And then uh, these, Andy or, or Holly probably be best to talk to about Newcastle. But um, <laughs> I had to go back to work and miss most of Newcastle. But on the way back, we literally just spent as much time surfing at Cloudbreak as we could right up to the end and then back to Australia. And, yeah, yeah. so to have the boat in such clean condition, because when you're, you know... When, when you're making a passage, it's not a number one priority to, yeah. to, to keep everything spick and span. It looks, it looks very presentable. I'm definitely not too um, responsible for the cleanliness this morning, but during the build, we, when you build your own boat, you've got plenty of time to sort of you know, figure out where you want to keep everything and hopefully everything sort of just goes back where it's supposed to quite quickly and easily. You know, it's not... Yeah. When you're living on board full time, you know, everything's got a home and it's just whoosh, tidied up. <laughs> no, I was going to say it's pretty good on this boat. I've been on other boats that are really cluttered, whereas on this boat... Actually, like, we only have what we need, which yeah. I think is a pretty, I mean, apart from musical instruments, but apart from that, it's pretty <laughs> awesome. Like, to be honest, not living in clutter is amazing and definitely a good thing on a boat. Yeah, and is that because you think there's lots of storage or is that because you don't have much junk? It's both. No, we have both. Both, yeah. There's a lot of storage in the boat and... We try not to accumulate too much junk. Yeah, we, well, yeah. obviously it's a, it's a pretty slender catamaran, so we've got to be a bit weight sensitive. So we will try and take what we need and only what we need to a point but we've still got four people's everything you know, we'll all live on here and like Holly said instruments there's two guitars a bongo drum two <laughs> ukuleles and now a didgeridoo okay <laughs> and you've got it's, numerous it's surfboards as well I noticed in the hatches <laughs> and in your bedrooms and the boat's <laughs> broken surfboards <laughs> <laughs> in the bedrooms they're broken how, how many surfboards do you have I couldn't tell you exactly. I reckon there's probably maybe 15 on here. 15 surfboards. Depends. When, when we have a couple other friends join us, like we had a couple other mates that all brought three and four and five with them to come and surf Fiji as well. So at one stage during the year, there's probably closer to 25 on board. But <laughs> the, stuff was it, it was built, the boat was built for it. Like Toys. the whole porthole in the forward end, there's just literally board storage because we want to be able to show up at any wave and take it on. And you can't really do that with just one or two boards, you know, and, and you're away for a whole year, you go through them, you can see the halves of boards in my, in my bedroom there because I'm too, too attached to them to throw them away. <laughs> it really does just show you how big the boat is, like when you can say, well, I've got like 15, yeah, yeah. sometimes and you can't, They're not in the way or anything. Yeah. They're tucked away into a purpose-built mm. yeah. uh, surfboard rack, very, uh, a very Aussie it's thing. Shit. I think oh, lots it, of people are going to appreciate not that. Ju- <laughs> got a, we can, we can got other stuff stored in there as well, and it's got a workbench and a vice and a and 240 watt power if you need it, so it's a bit of a shed, you know, like, like you'd have But I don't care about those things. <laughs> <laughs> you'd like the mountain bikes, there's three mountain bikes on board all yeah. the way. Yeah, yeah. and I noticed that the mountain up. bikes were in your beside bedroom as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sleep beside the, the bikes. That's, I'm guilty board. now because I, was, I just said I had a place for everything and, and Andrew and I were both mountain bikers, but when Liz joined the, joined the team and, and uh, started going out with me, she's a really mountain bike nut like that's her sport she gets the mountain bike out wherever she can and and, I, and we had to find a way to bring them on board and it's really made the trip a lot better having the bikes you can just adventure anywhere whether it's a city or the bush or whatever to have 
proper mountain bikes on board. And yeah, that we can that, that big wheels, you know, they don't fit in the surfboard locker, they don't fit anywhere else, so yeah, they lived up beside the beds. That fit next year when we put a new deck hatch in. Yeah, we've got a few mods. You're going to put a bigger place. hatch so it'll fit a tire. Yeah, definitely. A 26 or a 27? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> 27. 27. 27. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Get the adventure bike. Yeah. You've got the bikes in inside the the big black cases. Yeah, just soft bags. So does that protect the, them from the salt water at all? Does that stop the rusting at 20 degrees? Yeah, I That's guess. That's the secondary objective. The first objective is to keep spiky pedals off my paint job. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You, you, you sort of brought up all the different toys and stuff we keep on board and it's really just so like we're surfers first and adventurers and travel around and just make the most out of everywhere we go and, and sailing became the means to do all that to be able to take you home where you want so it's not like you know it sounds like oh we just go around and have toys everywhere it's kind of what we do I guess but yeah we really just the sailing side of things just a means to be able to take what well, we love it of course but it's this means to be able to take the take the adventure with us and do it environmentally friendly and, and then have the action and adventure bit when we get there because that's what we do when we're back in Taz. Can I go back and just ask you a bit about like what was the dream when you built the boat? I mean mm. you've, you've referred to it as home a couple of times. Yeah. Um, you know, was that the big goal? Was this to become home? Is this home or do you have another house or is this home and uh, Tell me about sort of what the, the sort of big plan is, and then we can. I do want to hear still about what you've been sailing over yeah. this past season. But what what's the big picture? Well, the, I guess I'll start with the dream bit. That was that's the kicker. Like when we we're in, I oh, probably in. We used to go away to travelling. My dad surfing, and we'd do trips around Taz or even to Indonesia. Or we travelled quite a, quite a bit for surfing when we were when we were young, and you always got there and you had a great time or found a way but you always wanted to know like around the corner what's there and can I just travel that little bit further but the, the main problem is you just can't when you travel on land you've got a limited amount of stuff and you don't have your home base with you so the whole point of Rome is to be able to travel not just with yourself but with your, your family and your friends with everything you need to have a really fun adventure and then be able to do it long term and sustainably you can go somewhere and set up your house in a remote location literally stay there as long as you want that's nice that's I the mean, dream that, that, that's cool I like the fact that you it's uh, an entertainment space for people to come like you know to your yeah. place and yeah. hang out that's yeah. sort of like part and, of the goal give, give people an experience that you can't have yeah. anywhere else so you said that you set off I think you said in the water about 18 months ago but then I think I read on the on the website and I've heard you mention that you went to pick your mast up in Melbourne because you originally so the boat's in Tasmania. Why why did you have to go to Melbourne to get a mast? Uh, when you build a boat yourself, you, it's all done on a budget and a time frame. You don't build a boat yourself. We, some people do because they want to build a boat, but most people build a boat themselves because they can't afford to buy a boat themselves to what they want, right? So everything's on a budget, and then to to get masts aren't made and there is a mast building company in Tasmania but if you get your mast bought made on the mainland the transportation costs across Bass Strait are huge this boat right. the mast on this boat is 18.6 metres so you're way out of standard for a road trailer so ah. it was far more economical for me to motor the boat across Bass Strait and get the most stepped in Williamstown than, than ship it from Tasmania all your spars did the mast and it just happened they get their metal extrusions done in Melbourne. So by a bit of timing and a bit of coordinating, and they do their own transport, they've got a purpose-built trailer. So they basically come down with an empty trailer to pick up raw extrusions to take back up to their fabrication shop in Brisbane. So right. by a bit of timing, I can get my finished mast put on the empty trailer coming down. They step the mast in Williamstown. They drive around the corner to the aluminium extrusion place, load it up with metal extrusion and ship back up to Brisbane. So... It was a win-win for both of us. They were able to give me a good price on transportation. We got a. We were lucky enough to get a pretty epic adventure in Bass Strait under on a on a power cat, and then and yeah. then we got it, and then we got the mast fitted up. And... To travel from Tasmania to Melbourne under like as a power cat, how much petrol did you actually use? Like oh, in me... dollars and cents. Oh, that's in my memory now. It's a bit over a year ago, but yeah. it's it slides through the water pretty well. Um, it's, we've got about 400 litres of, of diesel on board, and I think we only used about half of it. So, 
it, real basic numbers. We, we, get, we get close to, not quite, but close to, depending on whether you run one motor at a time at six knots or whether you run both motors at a time at eight and a half knots, we can get between just under two nautical miles per litre up to, up to um, well, being in favourable conditions running one motor, we can get even better than almost up to three nautical miles a litre. So I think in dollars and cents, I, I want to say we used somewhere around a couple hundred litres of diesel, so less than $300 worth of fuel somewhere in there, maybe a little bit over $300 worth of fuel. Yeah. And, and what was that trip like going across from Tasmania to Melbourne? Because it's yeah, been it's a got very the hairy little trip. Right. Especially in October, that's, yeah. can be, that's when our strongest westerlies come through. It's crazy. It's all about timing. Yeah, yeah we got really lucky. Um, we expected it to be a delivery, you know. The, the, the time frame between cold fronts in Bass Strait at that time of year can be pretty small, so we were expecting to just hot shot it, mm -hmm. and we got really lucky. We got a whole week. Um, that was kind of where the Rome sort of sail surf Rome video thing sort of kicked off. We started filming about then, and we have basically started recording. We managed to stop in Deal Island in the Kent group, get the mountain bikes out and ride all over there. That was really epic. Yeah. Was, I don't know whether anyone's ever ridden mountain bikes there before. And then we went to Flinders Island. We caught up with a mate we know from through surfing, and he showed us some spots there. We went surfing and and hung out with him. And it, it turned, and then I, oh, and then we ran into a, another mate from high school that's a cray fisherman that just happened to be up there cray fishing at the time. And, and then we went across and surfed again on Wilson's Prom. And it just it was like the first little taste of what this boat's become. You know, it's just everything you go and do just exceeds your expectations. Everywhere you go just becomes. And I want to say that. Like, I'd never sailed before, or we obviously weren't sailing because there was no mast or sails, but when I was talking about what I was about to do with work colleagues or clients and friends and family, they're like, oh my God, are you scared? Like, going across the Bass Strait? Obviously, they'd heard the same thing. You know, it's renowned to be really treacherous and scary. And I was like, well, no, not really. I um, feel pretty confident. Like, Michael's insured me it'll be fine and yeah. whatever. And so they were starting to wig me out a little bit. And I was like, oh, God, what's it going to be like? And it was, yeah, it was fine. It was pretty cruisy. Like, obviously, Michael and his dad and everyone had looked at weather windows and made sure it was going to be okay to, to go. But, yeah, it was smooth, smooth cat motoring. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you reckon? The forecasting taste is pretty good, isn't it? That's perfect. It, it's it, Tassie weather's predictable, but it, it's extreme, but it's predictable. And about the Bass Strait, I've crossed it four times in the last 12 months. Mm. And I haven't, as long as you know when that southwesterly change is coming through, as long as you get somewhere safe before it, you're fine. Yeah, well, we were talking earlier about like Sydney to Hobart races and things like that. And the thing about that race, is that they don't get a choice yeah. of weather window, yeah. isn't it? They, they, yeah. they definitely sail on that particular yeah. day, yeah. whereas the majority of cruisers are having great trips yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. along the coast. Right. Like I've sailed uh, from Melbourne, Port Phillip Bay, up to Wilson's Prom. Yeah, you just time the weather, yeah. Yeah. and that's it's it. a beautiful sail. Yeah. It's yeah. outstanding. It's not really something to be uh, just be scared of. It gives you a healthy respect for the weather. Yeah. Like yeah. You know that it can really bite you in the ass if you mess it up, but... If you are willing to go out there and, and watch the weather and set yourselves up in the right anchorages for when the blows come through, you, you're going to have a great time. And you know? there's places you can stop along the way, like yeah. you know, there's the Kent Group yeah. Island and and Wilson's Wilson's Prom and further down south or wherever around Tassie, there's lots of anchorages where you can tuck in and, yeah. and get out of the weather. But you guys actually did a circumnavigation of Tasmania is that the start of the sailing on the boat was that the first big trip you did it was kind of the end of our first um, bit of sailing I guess and we after we, what we were about we were just up to the masters on board and then um, we got the, the sailmaker um, Rob at Ullman came down from Sydney and, and measured us up for sails because we didn't want to get them done off the plan so everything was sort of pretty spread out just to make sure we got everything right um, so then, while he, the sales got made up, we had a good, what, six weeks, Liz? Yeah. yeah. So then we got the opportunity to, I brought, we went down to Geelong, and then I met a guy down there that had a, a similar shining boat, uh -huh. and um, he lent us a, a headsail, so then we were a motor sailor, rather okay. than just a motor power yeah. cat. Yeah. And then we did, a, as you do, sailing down south, you pretty much go over our wind, so we didn't get a huge amount of downwind Genoa sailing, unfortunately, but we did get a bit of sailing experience. As Liz had never sailed before at that stage, so to have, with the boat sort of happened in stages. It was a power cat, then we had a jib, and then we got right, all the right. sails. So yeah, so we we took the boat from from um, Williamstown in Mel near Melbourne there, 
to Geelong. Geelong, round Wilson's prom to Lakes entrance uh-huh. to the um, Gippsland Lakes there, and we had a good couple of weeks there. Andy, who's, who's on board then? Just me and Liz. And then <coughs> Andy finished up his job. Um, he's basically sabbatical started there. And <laughs> so he know? literally quit his job, he's a pharmacist. sold his everything, and um, he moved on. So then there's the three of us as full time on Rome. And from there, we motored up to Sydney. We went, got some great waves on the New South Wales coast, and the, and then uh, we went to into Cronulla Marina. Mm-hmm. And again, the um, sails were just getting finished. So as Rob finished the jib, the Genoa, we put that on the boat. And then he he had some. He's a he's a racer, so he had to go up to Phuket to the King's Cup up there. So we're like, oh no, we've got another ten days before the mains will be ready. Oh well, we'll just keep jibbing. So we went up to the pit water and hung around up there and sort of. Made the most out of the boat and getting to know it. What time of year was that? We were into late November, early December by this stage. So about this time of year. Yeah, uh, pretty much. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then mainsail on board, and then um, and then the plan was to sort of cruise back down to Tassie, but we had a um, a family a family funeral. We had to get back for my grandmother, and so we, we luckily we got the sails bent on the mainsail on, and then we pretty much hot shot it direct from Sip Cronulla to St Helens, where we live, and on the east coast of Tassie. That's it. That's pretty much the boat up and running now. And then, so Tassie became a shakedown cruise. What, what, what's that now? Is it now December? Uh, yeah, oh, pretty much. We, would, we, we had Christmas at home, and then we sailed to Hobart for New Year's. You know, who doesn't want to go to Hobart for New Year's? Okay. I said, one's dream, right? Sydney Hobart is down there. And we had mate down there, lives down there. And so we, Hobart for New Year's. We went sailing the Don Chicasto Channel and the east coast of Tassie and all of the great sailing that's down there on the southeast of Tassie. Went around the south coast. Right down to south, past South East Cape to South Cape, just down there, and then back up to Hobart. We had a mountain biking in Mount Wellington, took the boat out of the water for a little bit of a check check. It had been in the water eight months at that stage. and Antibar. Yeah, just wanted to just give it the once over. You know, right. you started sailing right. it, you wanted to just make sure your dagger ball cases were all, not, hadn't developed any cracks, mm-hmm. not getting water ingress. We never, all your through holes and never had a wet spot or anything like that. So we you know, got the boat out for its just initial check out of the water. And then from there we went round the southwest to Port Davey and then the Gordon River and then right back home. Right. And then and then that's it. All right, sweet. We know what we need for the boat. There was a bunch of other things we needed, safety equipment and finishing off and moving on board, a few lessons learnt. And then uh, from there, we, but basically the boat proved itself to be totally functional and safe and nothing major. And then from there, we, you know, water maker and we needed a staysail and a few things like that. And, we, we, we built a, a drogue, but we all went back to work for about two or three months. So what what do you all do? I know you've all got great professions, so let's start with Andy. What do you do? I'm a pharmacist. So how did you leave your job? What I happened? just left. <laughs> 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 no, nah, pharmacies. Mm-hmm. As an employed pharmacist, it's essentially the owners own the business and then you're employed by them. Right. So there's not, much, there's not much career path or prospects unless you start wanting to own one, so... I was working in a nice small town just with the owner and he was he like he I can still go back and work for him whenever he that, whenever I need to and he just gets less holidays when I'm not there. Oh that's so, what I was going to ask, can you go back to yeah, your yeah. job? You can I'll or be, you can't I'll do get paid more being a pharmacist or being a crew member for your brother? I definitely get paid more being a pharmacist <laughs> even when I only work for two weeks a year. <laughs> <laughs> but which do you prefer? Which yeah, yeah I even the two weeks a year, I probably still prefer being on a boat. Yeah, but, yeah, I bet. Great. And Holly, what, what about you? Uh, I'm a lawyer back mm. home, but I... And home is? Uh, England. So I was working in London before I left, and I'm from Kent, which is sort of... grew up on a farm, basically, in the countryside. But I lived in London for a while, and, yeah, I quit work last September and went travelling, and then... So did Asia first, and then came to Oz, and I was crewing on another boat. Um, to start with and then met these guys so yeah. so what are your plans for work then now like do you think you'll practice law here in Australia can you practice law in Australia no I'd have to do another year or something I think it's a year of um, exams to be able to practice in Oz it's not that different but there are differences um, but no my plan is I'm going back home for a bit to do some work but probably not in law um, I do like some property stuff on the side so I'll probably go and do that um, not much intention of being a lawyer again to be honest okay. <laughs> didn't love it I qualified did it for a few years didn't love it so um, no I'm hopefully going to be stay a salty sea dog and come back in a few months <laughs> after I've done some cash great, great and you're studying coding yes. and yeah I'm studying other things too what are you studying uh, coding so you can code up websites so 
plan to potentially be I can like live wherever and as long mm. as I've got access to internet I can work mm -hmm. from hopefully anywhere in the world so yeah hope coding websites so or really setting yourself up for having a great life that's great the plan. lifestyle yeah Fantastic. that's the plan I want to be able to live life rather than sit behind a desk in an office <laughs> basically full time salty seagull exactly <laughs> full time pirate <laughs> And Larissa, what is that you? Um, I am a hairdresser slash personal trainer. I was running my own two little businesses back home in Tassie and now studying nutritional medicine. So I couldn't really make up my mind what I wanted to do, but I love the health industry and helping people and working with people and that sort of thing. So that See. is the, uh, yeah, the, the, I guess, plan in the end is to be a qualified nutritionist and be able to write programs for people, whether it be online or or when we're at home, face-to-face, -face, health and nutrition programs. Wonderful. Yeah. And you could even, even with the, with hairdressing, you could always make some extra money, couldn't you? Yeah, hairdressing is a really adaptive yeah. trade for sure. Um, and in the past when I've been travelling, I've found, you know, anywhere I go I can find work hairdressing if I want to. Mm. And I still enjoy it, but I don't like being trapped inside in confined spaces and so I can relate to that yeah <laughs> so um yeah I haven't had much of an opportunity yet to do the whole hairdressing thing while we've been traveling except for on board Holly and Andy and Michael and and they don't pay well do they <laughs> <laughs> well it's just a you know a family favor I guess drink at, drink at the bar <laughs> yeah That's great but no um hopefully maybe I can you know, get some little business cards and the boys can drop them off in the surf for me if anybody needs a haircut or waterproof mm. laminated ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so you're halfway through your nutrition now, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. So are you doing it full-time, your study? Uh, it's not classed as full-time. It's twenty about 25 hours a week mm -hmm. it's meant to be. But, um, yeah, I'm living on the boat full-time, so it's been pretty... It's hard to commit to it full-time when you've got other things yeah. distracting you when you're traveling around or if we're doing a sailing passage um, it's quite hard to be studying full-time but then you know if I have some downtime when we're traveling then it's pretty full-on I'll be glued to my computer for the whole day and working on getting assessments in and so you're obviously in. doing it by distance education yeah yep, distance education and then um, there is some practical clinical time as well which mm -hmm. uh, I'll try and knock out while I'm home yeah, okay. It's amazing where the internet is there though, like that allows someone to be able to do a, a, a university type course online while you do this, you know, like, mm. as long as we get an internet connection here and there and, and you'd be surprised where you can actually get an internet connection overseas once you get a local sim, like it mm. hasn't really held you up at all has it? No, there's only been a couple of times when we haven't had the best reception and it's mm. slowed it, like it's Holly and myself down if we definitely need internet for those times but... Yeah, I can, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's just playing catch up when you do have good reception, take advantage of it, and knock out you know, a couple of lessons or whatever it may be. It's so wonderful to hear that. Like, I actually work as a, a lecturer at a university, and I work in um, in a program where we do it by distance education. So yeah. we teach nursing by distance education, and we uh, the students go off and do placements, even though they're studying online and by distance so it's exactly the same thing yeah. so I understand what you're going through and how hard it can be and I think it's probably the experience you gain when you're traveling as well like in these remote places when we go to remote islands and you see how you know nutritional deficiency might actually affect a community or if they're being exposed to in Fiji for instance sugar is one of their main industries so there's extra sugar in all their food products and you see how that affects the children in the villages teeth or their mm. skin and they have skin conditions and things mm. I think it's more of a real practical experience than being in a university lecture mm. um, you're out in the real world and learning that way so yeah and probably in Fiji they're probably all getting diabetes as well it's, it's as their the number one <laughs> yeah number one disease in Fiji mm. is diabetes so yeah and even while you're traveling you could do assignments related to what you're learning well, out there in yeah. in the real world yeah, yeah. when so you're traveling that's great yeah that's good mm. I enjoy it much better than being stuck in a classroom that's for sure yes <laughs> you get out you need to get yeah. out and exercise <laughs> yeah. and well let's move on Michael what what about you I'm an engineer 
Mm -hmm. um, I work in construction shipping, so actually I actually still have my original job that I come and go. So it, the, the um, it's, it hasn't been full time work lately, which has sort of worked out pretty good. So I'm supposed to be doing month on month off, but typically it's more like month on and two or three months off, which luckily I've finished building the boat, or it's mostly finished, and, and we can put more time for sailing and a little bit of time for work. So now it's working out really well. So do you fly out? From wherever you are, and these guys run the boat. Yep. So you leave yeah, home exactly. for a while. Yep, that's exactly what happens. So um, it's, uh, we've only, well, I've had three, two, uh, two or three, two trips. Yeah, two trips after we left Australia. I only had this year. So in the six months, I've done, I think a couple of, you know, not even a full month, a couple of three week trips back at work, and um, yeah, it keeps the whole show going financially. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is all very well for us all to quit our jobs, but yeah. But isn't that a great way to make it happen? Like you're still working, but yeah. you're able oh, to it's have job lottery. It really is, and yeah. it's 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 quite a fun job as well. David, do you want to work away from home? <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to get rid of me? No, I just... <laughs> Maybe I could go to Tasmania and go to the go to the Maritime College. I think that would be exciting, isn't that where you yeah. studied? At yep. the, it's, what's what's the name of the, the so, Maritime College? Australian right? Maritime College. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's got a really good reputation. It's, it's yeah, pretty yeah. world you class, meet isn't it? All over the world, and as soon as they hear you've studied at the Maritime College, like. I actually, um, occasionally I've got a, a, a polo shirt that I travel in, just oh. happen to have it on when I travel for work or whatever, and um, the amount of people that see that shirt and come and say, oh, my brother went down there and studied this and whatever, and all over, when you're on flights all over the world, it's, yeah. you know, it's got a really massive reputation. But what sort of other courses do they run down there? Well, it's, it's predominantly known for its seafaring. Yeah. Um, so producing captains and chief officers and, and engineers that actually run the ship's engine sort of thing. But they've got a huge range of stuff, and I did the... Um, ocean engineering so more of the design engineering construction engineering stuff so they've got all sorts of business management marine management fisheries so I, i've been out of it for a little while safety related training and yeah, yeah. I wouldn't, wouldn't uh be able to tell you their whole course has so been back there for a few years now but um where's the college exactly is that near Hobart? no no the other end of the state in launceston it's in launceston yeah it's so all, all based right. around the tamar river in launceston there and is that a driving campus. distance from where you said your home's Port no, Henry, no. Did you say? No, it's a couple of hours. So home for the weekend and then back up. Okay. We started boarding away. Right. We're in a bit of a rural area, Tassie, so we had to start boarding all away from school after grade ten. So we were, we were up in Launceston for what, year eleven and twelve to finish the high school, and then and then I'm going into uni. So six years I was up in Launceston away from the surf and nearly killed us. But right, right, right. So <laughs> and so you, were you both in boarding school from year ten? Um, well, it's not really boarding well, school. 10, 11, we live we, with a family member, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we lived with our grandma for okay. two years, for the last two years of school, um, separately. So Michael's two years older than me. And then he got a house with some friends for uni. Uh -huh. And then I, when I finished college, I went down to Hobart to do university down there. So we haven't really lived at home since we were 16, probably. I haven't lived in a house wow. with Andrew at the same time since he was in grade 8. And then he, and then he came right. back and lived on the boat full time. So how, for a year now. Right, so how was it getting back together and living together? I mean, you've got four of you that have been living on the boat now for for six months, apart from when you go away, it's probably makes Party things time. good. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, how, I mean, how have you been getting along? Our brothers always have brothers' differences, and if we're surfing, then it's probably pretty good. Yeah. And then when we're, when we're sailing, we actually work really well together, and it's fine, it's just brothers are brothers, really. We get along pretty well, to be honest. Most of, most of the time, we talk to people in the south. They go, oh, "I could never do that with my brother." So really? yeah. I think we do pretty well. Yeah. The majority of people say that. Actually. Yeah. Like, oh, that's like well done. You're brave, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> well, just the fact that you're here together means that you've got a lot of common interests, and you're obviously oh, yeah. very alike. Yeah. Because you love to do it. You know? So fortunate. Like mm. I got to spend six years in the shed building a boat with my dad. Mm. That's it's irreplaceable, priceless. right? And then I get to sail full time with 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 my, my partner Liz and my brother Andy you know and, and and now Holly's here full time as well and there's just a huge community of friends and family that just come and go and mm -hmm. and that we like thought that this would be like Liz and I and then sometimes some family and sometimes some friends and it's turned out to be full time family pretty much and also that th third cabin I should have built a boat with six cabins. Like it's, <laughs> we're, we're sailing with four minimum, six and seven people almost all the time. 
Um, and yeah, it's, that's the whole to be able to just take all your friends and family with you. That's it's just it's, it's gone above and beyond what we ever really hoped it to do. You nearly put tears into my eyes. <laughs> 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 it's tears, isn't it? You would, you would have been like telling us we were children last week when we were fighting over something. <laughs> 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 are, you, are you guys 30? I think you sound like 15, it 12. Definitely, it definitely comes out sometimes. I say, oh, just stop being childish. Yeah, 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 yes. Maybe we should have snuck the mic on like, yeah. in between watches at maybe about 2 a.m. in yeah, the morning yeah. when yeah. somebody's got to wake somebody else up and say, it's your turn, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Bronk probably has Bronk's got an outsider perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. Um, I think there's a sailing team as well we all work oh, pretty yeah. like yeah I think we all complement each other pretty perfectly especially if something ever goes wrong it's like I was saying this I think to Liz it's surprising how you know like in a you know bad situation something goes wrong but we all like snap to it like no one's the weak link it's no. all it's pretty and we're all fluid. reasonably calm I think now as well in a situation where we may have to react quickly if it's you know wind picks up and it's a suddenly buster coming through or something like that and we have to get the main down in a hurry we're all pretty calm and which yeah. is the way we need to be so mm. there's no arguing at that point in time <laughs> just try and respect this boat can be a handful at times you can sail it conservatively and, and and put minimal sail up and still get around at more than adequate speeds and comfort which is in a pretty bulletproof mode but if you've got it cranked up a bit you've got to be sort of paying a bit more attention because it can be, that's where it sort of transforms to be a bit of a sailing weapon when it wants to be. But it, you can power it right down and make it really safe for sort of Two modes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm thinking back to when we'd been sailing a few times and we've had some hairy experiences and all you, all that happens is that I scream ah! <laughs> really loudly. So. We just have to scream later. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> but you must feel like because you, you were a beginner sailor. Yeah, I'd never sailed. Like Michael said, it was one and step at a time, the mast. And then a, a genetic that we <coughs> borrowed off somebody to yeah. motor sail around. And, but have you been, has he been teaching you? Yeah, both of those guys, like Andy and yeah. I, were together for a, a little while, just the two of us as well, in yeah. Gibson's Lakes. And that was all new to both of us, I guess, like having to, well, Andy had Handle. far more experience than oh. I, but on Rome to anchor in new anchorages and... and uh, we had some wind too. Yeah. It was windy, so... <laughs> Just in, learning what in like, lakes entrance. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just learning. Lakes, yeah. yeah, we're learning what your anchor can handle in a boat. This has got a, quite a lot of windage, really high side, so it yeah. dances around a bit on anchor and just learning what to trust and what to actually be worried about. And depths as well. We have some pretty shallow depths that we're anchoring <laughs> in. Which we weren't sure whether to tell Michael about or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, it's definitely been. Well, Holly was an experienced sailor and Michael and Andy both had sailing background, so I guess in the last six months I've learnt from everybody. So tell us quickly about the... I can't remember where we got to in the story. You've done a lap of Tasmania. Yep. You've got Mars, sails, back to Tasmania. You do a lap around. Um, I just had one quick question, because Andy, you said you really liked... Port yep. Davy on the west coast. Yeah, southwest. Up, southwest yeah. coast yeah. of Tasmania. Quickly tell me, there were some other guys, um, Jack and Judy oh, Blinder. Jack and Judy. And, and, and they posted <laughs> pictures in there. Yeah. Okay, and then just looks spectacular. It's and it, it's really like, the way I understand it, tell me if I'm wrong, it's like a fairly narrow entrance, but into a, yeah. a very big sheltered... Oh, yeah. And it goes yeah. for ages. Does it? Yeah. Yeah. It's like, sort of a... A hidden entrance into the Bathurst Harbour. So Port Davies, right. the bay entrance, and I don't know whether they found it straight away. And then behind these, the Breaksea Islands, huge islands, is a narrow channel that goes 10 nautical miles inland right. into the Bathurst Harbour, which is four times the size of Sydney Harbour yeah. inland. Wow. Lake. Um, the only way you can get there, there's a small, small airstrip that you can fly little, like 10 seater planes in there. Or you can bushwalk in, or by boat, and that's that's it. So there's there's ten bushwalkers there, and the cruisers, and oh, it's wow. the most remote place you can get to safely. And so it's narrow for quite a long time. Yeah, getting to the harbour. Yeah, it's, it's not just, just like you go through and then no, it opens na- up. Narrow for ten miles, wheels 10 miles. around, and yeah, it's wow, yeah, it's quite. Quite a fun little. We tried to sail up there with not much wind. <laughs> that was quite fun for a while, and and the water's tannin stained, so because of the trees. Yeah. So it's 
black, so you don't know how it, yeah, it looks like tea, so you can't see how deep it is. The black. skipper wasn't freaking out about getting I think stained this, this holes. was a skipper at that stage. Yeah, sure. I was steering and Andy was running from side to side <laughs> with the sail because the wind wouldn't... Uh, <laughs> couldn't yeah, I, was, I was the spinnaker <laughs> pilot. We've done that more than once. <laughs> but the tannin can sort of stain the... You didn't get any no, staining didn't from get it. Any staining, oh, yeah. Didn't notice that. The most staining we got from coloured or tannin stained water yeah. was in New Caledonia. At the de Conage. Yeah, yeah. And I think that was from apparently there was like a cobalt mine or something there, so it must be the minerals in the soil, but that was the So did it go what colour? Right, it was, it was like an orangey, orangey red red red. soil. We spent a while scrubbing that, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like shit. I think it was mainly from our shoes on the back step, but we definitely had to get the polymer out on that one. Yeah. Just a cleaning product. So after the, the lap of Tasmania, how did you end up in New Caledonia? Because that was the first overseas port. Yeah. yeah. We basically had a plan to do the Pacific for what well, was going to be a basically a one year trip, was the original plan, but um, which would involve south, southern hemisphere half, and northern hemisphere half, and then back in, in Australia. Right. Um, sort of in the end of this summer coming up but anyway so we we sailed we wanted to go to new zealand then up into the pacific the normal cruising route Tonga, yeah PG. yeah anyway so this this we, we were a bit late probably finishing off a few jobs and i got a bit of extra work and it was into may by the time we were ready to leave tassie and normally that wouldn't be too bad a time may june the, the, the lows are still quite a nice in the southern ocean and the highs are kind of flat bottom so we we're going to sail direct tassie to new zealand um but this winter just went mental down south with the El Nino and really tight, powerful lows. So we just couldn't get away the window to work. So we managed to sneak across to Victoria, sat in Eden for a bit, still wasn't getting a weather window, went up to Sydney, hung around there for a little while, and then still wasn't getting a weather window, so we'd like, oh, bugger it. Ooh. So you're working your way up the coast, looking at New Zealand, going, Basically moving. can we get, can we go, can we go? Yeah, from Port of Entry to Port of, of Entry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right, okay. Because so anyway, that's what I, I was like, oh, I wonder why they didn't go to New Zealand. So anyway, yeah, we, did, we finally went, okay, we'll go to, go to Fiji Direct. And then I had some work come up. I didn't have time to get all the way to, a job. I couldn't turn down work, basically. Mm. So I... I, we, we said, oh, we've got a new cow, and that turned out to be just an unplanned, literally changed countries three times in a week where we were going to go to New Zealand, wow. Fiji, and then ended up in New Cow. Okay. And yeah, that, and I jumped off pretty much as soon as we got to New Cow, and these guys had an awesome month there, and then jumped back on, we went to Fiji, had amazing experiences. Hang on, you skipped part of the story though. Didn't you guys, didn't I read somewhere you stopped at Middleton Reef? Yeah. yeah. On yeah. the way across? Now, I want to know about that, because uh, awesome. I was just recently, I was reading back through some of the stuff on my website, and I talked to a a guy called Alan that I'd sailed with and he was out sailing when they were looking for the guy, I think his name Bill Belcher, that, that got stranded on Middleton yeah, yeah. Reef okay. and right. so I'd read a little bit about it. I read his book, but is it, what, tell us what Middleton Reef was like because you guys stopped there, didn't yeah, you? So Delib deliberately. Yeah. <laughs> we, um, I work with a surveyor on the ship I work on who used to be a Royal Australian Navy surveyor and he said... I must have been musing about wanting to go to Lord Howe Island or something to him at the station. He goes, if you're ever that, uh, that way, go to Middleton Reef. Right, right. And I was like, oh, yeah, this sounds sweet. Never thought about that again. And then we were literally on underway, left Australia, on the way to New Cow, mm -hmm. and it was like, oh, Middleton Reef is literally 10 miles off my current course over ground. Because you departed from and Sydney? Like, Middleton yeah. Reef. Yeah, yeah. yeah. straight yeah. out of yeah. Sydney. And then um, we went up the coast. We hugged the coast for a day and a half there. It was just howling westerly, and the idea was just jump on the back of the westerly once the front went through. So we cleared out of Sydney and shot up the coast, almost got up as far as Coffs Harbour, and then rolled out on the back of the, the westerly as it went sort of lighter southwest and then southerly. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, that worked out really good. Got to Middleton, out toward near Middleton Reef and used the opportunity to get in there and just this, our water maker doesn't make... The, the, if it's really rough, it works most of the time, but if it's really rough, we get air into our intake for the water maker. So we swung into Middleton Reef, used the opportunity to make some water, got on the sat phone, texted mum to email the border force, Australian border force, just to let them know what we're doing. And then mm -hmm. while we are there, we had a kite surf on board, mum and mates in, and just had a quick snorkel and checked the joint out and just was like... Tons of shots. What? <laughs> this place is the most Beautiful. amazing place we've ever yeah, seen. It's incredible. Else. We flew is the drone. Right? Yeah. Andy yeah. flew his drone it's, over it as well. It's just it's so, insane. so spooky to come up because I was on watch at about as the sun came up so 5.36 in the morning and you come towards it and you can just see the wrecks 
So you, there's no land, and there's no land above the water level. Yeah. And all you're just seeing is these ships, and one of them's a massive tanker that's just slowly rusting and decaying, which is the one you said the guy lived in. Yes, was yes. Looked for. And so he's, it's just these wrecks, and you see nine wrecks scattered in a sort of, that many there? Yeah, oh. in about a three to five mile radius around the, the right. kidney shaped reef. Yeah. And you just sneak around the bottom and anchor in a beautiful sand patch about 10 to 12 meters of the clearest water. Yeah. Sharks clear. everywhere, sort of Galapagos, little, 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 little Galapagos reef sharks that are the friend, they're like puppy dogs, just chase you is everywhere. It, um, <laughs> is it actually a marine park or anything? Yeah, is that why there was so much life there? Yeah, we looked in the south. literature because we had. Um, some information on board for Lord Howe and there's a one to the south Elizabeth Reef that the, the literature said you need to get a permit from Lord Howe huh? pretty much don't go there don't, you know, yeah. that's like it, permission only and then Middleton is, has some, some, yeah, some, a lot of fishing restrictions and that sort of stuff right. but yeah. it doesn't have the, the permit Okay. Yeah. You didn't I don't, I don't, I don't, one guy told me more recently yeah. that it does now or doesn't, but the, the literature we had at the time said... Right, right. <laughs> we'll just oh, that's cool. Yeah. So then you went to New Cal, mm -hmm. and what happened there? You, you, you guys had a great time, time, and I went back to work. <laughs> <laughs> Michael went back to work, and we had my parents and Holly's parents came on, so there was okay. a full boat, and we just went adventuring around yeah. New Cal, surfing... Awesome. Exploring, just just Tons of really, life. it was yeah. really good. Just getting used to the boat in a tropical country, really. With and it's good to have Holly's dad on and my dad on, who are both sailors as well. So heaps of people to help out. And it's yeah. quite a cruising ground there, That's isn't amazing. there? I mean, we didn't. We went through New yeah, Cal, but only cool. just to stop in at uh, New Mia. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, we were looking at the charts and just. I just, don't think that that many people actually. No. Spend a lot of time cruising there. No, it's, it sort does of, have it's, a, a, it's a quick stop off for the New Zealand circuit. They do yeah. sort of a, a couple of weeks at the end of their trip before sailing back south. But the Southern Lagoon's mm. 60 miles long, sheltered water mm. cruising mm. With, mm. with hundreds of anchorages, and they're all really easy because the, the water's a bit colder, so there's less coral heads. So it's nicely sand bottom anchorages that you're not worried about. Yeah. And they even put moorings in a lot of them that you're free to use. And then down south has got Ilda Pins, which is a half day sail down south, which is an amazing place with mushroom rocks and things, just incredible. Yeah. yeah. The marine yeah. life is absolutely insane as well. Yeah. Like snorkeling and yeah. the scuba diving as well. It's just you see more things than I've ever seen and I've dived in a lot of countries and it was just absolutely okay. incredible. And they have the restrictions. Sharks and yeah. turtles. It's a shark sanctuary, so if you're into seeing sharks, it's perfect. Like, right, right. Absolutely. Every the time chartage, from a sailing point of view, the chartage there is spot on, which is yeah. not something you can say for the majority of Fiji, which is far more challenging. Right, right. How long were you in New Caledonia? Just one month. Just. Just, 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 <laughs> just we, we barely, one month. Honestly, we barely scraped the surface of New Cal. Yeah. We, right. we explored the Southern Lagoon and Ilda Pins, but there's all the, the, the whole eastern coast with the Loyalty Islands and around the north. There's so much good cruising there that we right. didn't get to see, really. We didn't we need more time. I and there were some good surf breaks there as well. Lots. Kite surfing as well. Yeah, everything yeah. Had yeah. Good, surf. Yeah, yeah. good place. Yeah, Just yeah. a little bit expensive food-wise. Yeah. Right, so yeah. while the skipper's away, you guys did play. Yeah. <laughs> and my parents actually did. drove inland, so they did six days driving inland, and they said that was really, like, incredible too, like, to see that sort of side of it as well. Yeah. It's cool, so. It's funny, isn't it, because really it's not so much on the tourist map, even for Australians, mm -hmm. to go and hang out in New Caledonia. No, but no one goes there. Isn't it's funny? Exactly. I don't know why that is. Just They don't speak English really at all. Yeah. Like, they're very French. Like, mm. it's very... No one really tries to speak much to you apart from French, so I guess that might put some people off. Yeah, perhaps it is. Yeah. But for a, from a sailing perspective, it's definitely a place that is so close to Australia. And like Michael said, the chartage is spot on, and there's so many anchorages. We had a lot of the time anchorages to ourselves, right, and right. the boys had like surf breaks to themselves, and yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty Whereas cool. On land, maybe it's not as. I don't know, as appealing. Your parents had a great time really liked it. down in Nilda Pins and, and that's And they sort of drove thing. all up from Numea, all up the coast, and they said it was awesome. Yeah. They yeah. really liked yeah. it. Yeah. Really remote, yeah. but really cool. Yeah. yeah. Did your parents fly all the way from the UK? Yeah, they did for well? a month. So they stopped in Oz, New Cal, Malaysia, Singapore, and sort of thing on the way. So they're just sort of a month away. And they were with you for how long? Um, they were on the boat for five days, and then I... 
got off the boat and spent like four days with them in Ile de Pins as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nice because I hadn't really seen them much for like a few nearly over a year, so mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. And your dad came on to Andy, you said. Your yeah, mum and dad. dad. How long were they there for? Uh, they were there for two weeks. So, so they met each other? Yeah, yeah. they met. <laughs> yeah, that's they got nice, on. Isn't it? They were because you've been similar in some ways. They? <laughs> <laughs> they like a bit of a party, our parents. So. <laughs> and you've only known them. each other for six months now. Yeah, yeah? so at yeah, that time it would month. have been about a month. <laughs> yeah, we met <laughs> like April. How did you meet? Uh, I was crewing on another boat, and I sailed down past St Helens, which is where Andy lives. I didn't stop in St Helens, but um, we both had Tinder, so our apps must have crossed paths in our 30 or 40 mile radius <laughs> and I had an email saying that Andy had read my blog and he'd, we'd matched on Tinder or something and he'd read my blog and uh, we were doing similar things and if I ever came to St Helens to let him know and then like I just like I was like oh okay cool but I don't think I'm ever going to be there I don't really know where it is and about two days later my skipper was like we're going to St Helens you're going to drive me my skipper at the time on a wine tour and I was like oh okay yeah sure <laughs> so I met Andy and then we met a couple more times and then I... And then we convinced you to join Rome. And yeah. I left ship and <laughs> joined Rome. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And Rome sails a lot easier as a four-person boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's easy doing, much better Just doing. balanced. You brought yeah. the balance. Yeah, the just ship. doing shifts, there I think, and stuff like that. We run, so. we run two people awake at all times on night passages yeah. just yeah. because they're doing any sail change. It's a lot more comfortable to have someone awake and ready, right, if something happens quickly. So even just failing the Genoa is a bit of a two-person job to do it smoothly. So yeah. it's a lot easier to run two people up. Mm -hmm. Works a lot better, so four works perfectly. That's the only reason mm. I was allowed on, really. Six <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. Okay. We were hoping Andy would find true yeah. love. Yeah, true love. There His chances once we got out into the Pacific might have been a bit more limited. So it's not a bad Don't meet many other people. <laughs> And then once he's got her on board for six months and she can't really get off. <laughs> so I actually remember what that question started with and that was where you've been and then why didn't we go to the other half of the story which is the Northern Pacific was I guess after cruising the boat for six months there's a there's nothing serious but there's a handful of jobs we want to do to the boat to improve it again. So we took the opportunity to and we'd miss New Zealand so instead of going up and basically missing that area, mm. we're going to basically come back regroup a bit more money a little bit of work on the boat because as you can see it's not finished right there's no the lighting's pretty average the there's certain parts of the boat that were you know it's a home built boat and it was finished to go sailing so we the lighting interior lighting and, and some of the more cosmetic what i think is cosmetic stuff was sort of left mm. was done a bit a bit quickly so there's the serious stuff the sailing stuff and all the safety stuff spot on i believe <laughs> and it's proved to be but yeah so when we got to the stage where people sort of clean their teeth with hair torches and a few other things and a couple of other little things so we, we come back home get regroup get some more money and then the going forward bit is yeah head out again to do the pacific again next year hopefully not skip new zealand again if the weather allows us to get over there and then yeah do a full proper lap of the Pacific over the next year or two so each sort of trip Tassie was a sort of summer thing the next trip was a whole season and then I'm hoping they sort of keep expanding and compounding like that and becoming sort of bigger and bigger That's expeditions funny because I had you know when I was saying I had um, Jack uh, Jack and Jude Jack and Jude on he was talking about sort of when people start sailing it's good to sort of go from small circles to medium circles to bigger circles which is exactly what we well, you know about describing. big circles <laughs> yeah but, <laughs> it's, it's never been. but, the, but the concept yeah, 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 yeah exactly. it sounds exactly what you're describing it sounds really logical baby doesn't steps. it yeah yeah ba baby steps sort of learning going a bit well, like constantly learning yeah. what we can do what the boat can do yeah. like everything so. you guys were watching the sunset yep. the time's ticking away I think we might wrap up yep um there's so much more to your trip if, but you guys have been keeping a uh keeping track of your travels in a couple of places one's the youtube channel yeah. that's got a few videos up now it's i looked it up it's uh sail surf rome that's yeah, it correct. that's the name so i'll put a link to that when i do the show notes and things and we, we can share that that's around it. people will be able to keep keep a track of you there you've got a website that's sailsurfrome.com perfect yeah. good you've got consistent <laughs> branding yeah. which is going to be easy for people to remember the boats roam they like to surf what, how did the sand come in? It just fitted in the middle? Yes, 
What do we got? Where else? All your other socials, Instagram, Facebook, all South So From. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you like doing those things, jump on. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Um, so people can track you down, watch your videos and things, see what's going there. We didn't talk much about Fiji, but there's a few videos there about your surfing and your sailing around in Fiji. Yeah, so people be, can go and check that out. Have you got some more to add? Yeah, there's going to be probably seven Fiji videos total. Oh, okay. Including, so, including the passage home. So even though you're not, you're sort of on your way home now, but you've got a bit of a backlog of yeah, some videos got, that you'd still like to put we've out. Got, Excellent. We've got one left in Fiji, which is sort of the close of Fiji, and then we've got the passage back that I, that's all sitting on my camera. That's going to take a few yeah. few days of editing. I think that one. That all one's right. a bit different though. That's yeah. a get to know us. So we thought like we don't ne- maybe necessarily show complete like get to know us completely in our videos in the past. So it's yeah. more of a what each other thinks of each other and the opinions on the boat and so it would be more of a bit more like this chat I guess a bit, a bit, a bit yeah, more personal a bit more people <laughs> things as well as the passage because passage is a nine day passage the, the ocean's lovely to look at but you can see the same shots every day so yeah. to mix yeah, it up yeah, a bit yeah. we've added a bit more in this and next one Oh, that sounds like fun. I'll get, I'll subscribe, and we can, we can watch along and watch, <laughs> watch them coming out. We originally started making videos that were more like GoPro commercials, that were just music and action, and just to remember our trips by. But it, it turns out people actually want to know about what's going on, and so we get everyone that's comments basically saying we want less music, more talking. So we try not to go too far from our roots as a surfing sort of yeah, film background, yeah. but. Yeah, we're trying to. People want to know people, I guess, and it, rather than just watch people go surfing. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Oh, that's good. I'm sure you'll find a really uh, connected audience. What you guys are doing at your age is just awesome, isn't it, Karina? Yeah, it's, it's wonderful. It's, it's, it's so makes me so happy to see you guys living life and having such a wonderful time traveling. It's I'm speechless. It's thanks, wonderful. thanks so much. Yeah. If anyone yeah. watches and enjoys them, it, just makes us so happy. We really make them for us, and if people like them. That's just awesome. That's really. yeah. But the social media connection thing, like anyone get in touch with us and let us know and tell us about good spots or figure out ways to get involved or get on board or whatever, you know, it's, it is, it's a, the whole thing's a community. It's not, yeah. it's not a YouTube channel just to whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's really just to connect, Networking. connect, yeah. connect and yeah, network yeah. With, yeah. with cool people. And it, it's just been phenomenal, the response and feedback. And yeah. I was pretty hesitant to get involved with that sort of social media side of things to start with, but it's just compounded the trip and made it, so much better. Oh, that's good. It's yeah, pretty yeah. positive from everyone almost yeah. so far. Like it's yeah. been awesome. I imagine that it, it's satisfying to sort of share stories, but yeah, there's a lot of people I think will be at home. Perhaps it's not their time right now, yeah. but they'll really enjoy seeing you guys doing it and and dreaming that that's that's what they're going to work towards. As yeah, well. if you can help people motivate to yeah. finish their yeah. amateur built boats or get their dream start or whatever, that's great. But and, and that's that's even if only a couple of those people did it, it would be worthwhile. But with the amount of people that have connected and made the trip better, or come on board, or just wrong, he, he came on board. He just came up to say good day. I've seen your videos. How are you going? And six hours later, he'd stamped out of Fiji and did a passage with us. You know, like it's just <laughs> I mean, yeah, because just because of yeah. online social media, you meet so many people you would not normally have met. That's right. And it all it all adds to the whole thing. Good. Well, thanks, you guys. That's awesome. been, been terrific. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks, yeah. thanks for our other special guest, Karina. Yeah. yeah. Most yeah. important guest. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Michael, for inviting Karina and I out to come and see your beautiful home. Uh, Thanks, Liz, Andy and Holly for sharing your stories. Uh, Speaking of sharing, I just noticed the latest video on, uh, on the South Surf Rome YouTube channel. It's titled... The Romantic Proposal on a Deserted Island. So if you'd like to check out uh, some surfing at Cloud Break, a visit to the island where the film Castaway was made, plus a romantic proposal on a deserted island, then subscribe to the Sail Surf Rome YouTube channel and catch up there with the crew from Rome. Now, thanks for listening. I hope you had a great day and thank you for joining us on our journey. You really have been listening to David and Karina Anderson of the Sailing Podcast.